uh, session. So, uh, Dr. Santos, the floor is yours now. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I would like to say that it is an honor for me to be a panelist in this session. And we, we're going to, to start by following the, the learning objectives that was, were stated by the session. We're going to start to consolidate knowledge regarding the current interpretation of those values in the city. Past to the optimization measures using scanner technology factors and then uh, analyze the impact of dose optimization on patient dose and image quality. So it's well known that CT is responsible for a large proportion of effective collective dose across the countries. European uh, countries have studied this recently, however we know that all while CT examinations are performing in a large number. So, starting by the first topic, analyze the current reduction dose values used in CT is mandatory. The CT dose values could be uh, described in different modes, and sometimes we hear to talk about dose when we talk about patient dose, organ dose, or examination dose. Patient doses normally are described in effective dose and uh, presented in millisieverts. Organ dose are also presented in millisieverts and can, they can be measured or they can be software calculated. Uh, examination dose are described for CT in CTI vol in DLP values and they are available in our CT scanner uh, all, day, all days. But it's important to know what kind of dose values that we are looking at. We need to analyze what kind of CTDI call that uh, it's available on our CT scanner. For example, if you are using uh, a CT scanner that represents the CTDI call for body examinations, you should have included the indication of the patient size. This is an example of the dose report from Siemens indicating the size of the finding. Or, for example, and, uh, if you are using a general electric um, CT scanner, you should also analyze the information about the phantom that was used to calculate CTDI vol. It's all important to state that if you are looking for pediatric CT examinations, CTDI vol calculations must have a factor of 2.5 included. CTDI vol have also have a lot of limitations. We all know that CTDI vol represents a value for uh, different uh, patient sizes, as, and it's important to analyze, especially for body regions, the impact of the patient size on in these values. For this, you could use specific size dose estimates that is based on the conversion of the CTDI vol values using a conversion factor to calculate SSDA. CTDI vol is also useful to calculate the DLP. DLP values could be calculated based on the range size uh, of our examination study. And DLP values could be useful to calculate effective dose using the corresponding key factor of this specific body region that we are studying. The most common CT dose descriptors still uh, be, uh, sorry, still are CTI vol in DLP values, and they are used to calculate diagnostic reference levels. Diagnostic reference levels can be calculated in a retrospective mode based on the DICON header information or on a pack system, or in a prospective mode based on the patient or phantom data. It's important to know that if you are calculating this in a retrospective mode, sometimes you don't have enough data about the patient size. And uh, you could, could have uh, different types of patients included in these calculations. However, this method is very fast and simple. To calculate DRLs on the prospective mode, you must be aware that it's hard to obtain standard patient samples. And if you do it using phantoms, the value, uh, the obtained value, it's not so real. So this method, it's more time consuming. Don't forget that at the moment you have a lot of those monitoring systems 
that could calculate the IRLs for you. However, it's important to understand how they are calculated and how to interpret the data that you obtain with these systems. So, if you want to calculate your local DRL, you should calculate it based on the 75th percentile dose values of CTDI and DLP. If you want to calculate the national DRL, they were based also in 75th percentile dose value, but calculated based on the P50 of the values of the dose of the different sizes. And for example, for the European DRL calculations, they were based on the P50 of the, all the national DRLs. At the moment, the new approach for DRLs calculations should be the clinical imaging task, and you should focus on the standard patient group. So, what is a standard patient? If you are looking for adults or if you are looking for pediatric, standard patients have different uh, points of examination. If you are talking about adults, you must analyze the height and the height of the patients to select a standard patient. If you are looking for pediatric, you also need to include the age of the patients. And recently, you have more information about the pediatric categorization, but we also had uh, groups based on age, on the European guidelines, and now at the moment, using the PIDRL um, data, we analyze that the patients should be characterized, uh, characterized according to the patient age for body CT examinations, and if you are studying head CT examinations, you must use also the age of the patient. So, the DRL is calculated based on 76% of the dose values, and this should be the value that you compare with other studies. However, it will be useful for you if you could use the, the 95% dose value that could be uh, considered an alert value for auditing. Also, the P50 could be useful if you are trying to optimize your DRL and you want to be lower than this value on your daily practice. The most frequent CT procedures are the head, chest, and abdominal studies. And for these values, you will you found a lot of literature that represents different diagnostic reference levels. You should have you should select one of these to compare with, with your daily practice. However, there is a lot of variability on the DRLs calculation. We all know that they are based on standard patients. However, when you look across the countries, you're going to see that DRLs for the same body regions, this is an example for head CT examinations, could be very different. And if you are looking for a specific or clinical task, as Eurosafe Imaging proposed recently, uh, for example, if you are looking for a quick stroke of a head CT examination that was performed with a specific or clinical task, or another example, if you are performing a chest CT for the pulmonary embolism indication, you can see that a large um, variation on the dose values could be fine, and you could have three times more dose in different uh, types, uh, uh, sorry, in different examinations. So it's important to understand that DRLs have a large of variability, and you need to analyze your daily practice and plan and compare, measure again, and do it in, in order to optimize your practice and. Uh, how did your values, as uh, is stated on the recommendations of the European guidelines for clinical how to. So, you have your local DRL, and then during the time you decide to optimize your practice, you decrease your dose values, and you optimize again. And during the time, the expectation will be to decrease those and decrease the risk for the patients that go to uh, that um, are submitted to examinations in your department. So DRLs have a lot of challenges. Uh, one of the challenges is the dose descriptor that you're going to use, analyze correctly if it's uh, pro properly defined in your CT scanner, uh, define the body regions that you wanted to study select the characterization of the patient that you wanted to use, and analyze your uh, type of informatic system that you have available in your department. And 
Of course, if you wanted to do it, uh, do it also by, based on the clinical indication that you um, suggest that is more frequent in your department and taking into account the CT scanner technology that you have. So it's important to know how to use your CT scanner to promote optimization. And we all know that CT scanner design features have changed in the, the years. Uh, in the last decade, they were prepared to increase the capacity to be more faster and to get more fin finer details in, in the images. However, recently, in the last years, they pretend to uh, try to get tools to reduce those and maintain the image quality. Independently of the type of the, the scanner that you have, you, you could use different um, optimization tools that are available in all the scanners. For example, the ISO center. ISO center is a quite, uh, quite obvious. Of course, you need to put the patient on the pen in the center of the gantry. However, sometimes it's not happen and you could have high dose values or you could have high noise because the patient is not proper positioning. So it's important to state that this is the first step, positioning correctly the patient on the ISO center of the gantry. Other thing that is important, if you are using modulation system, they will Function, the function of the system will work properly if you put the patient on the ISO set. Considering the, the point that I presented to you before, if you want to calculate SSDE for the body uh, CT examinations, you're going to have a, a scout effect. The scout is going to increase and you're going to take the measures of the patient and they will be also increased. And the calculation of SSD will be um, with an error because you increase the dose because of the incorrect positioning and you will also increase the noise because the patient size will be uh, affected on the scout view calculations. If you want to know more about this, uh, the importance of the, the participation on the, in the center of the country, you could go to Eurosafe's uh, website and um, check the CT working group reports. About the range size. Range size, it's not depending on the, the technology that you have in your CT scanner. And uh, you have on the IAEA 10 pearls an indication that you should adequate the size of your range according to the clinical indication. For example, if you are performing a chest CT examination, you could have a dose reduction if you would equate the size of the range um, and you could have a reduction of 20 to 30 percent. Other studies indicate that, you, for example, for lumbar spine, if you would equate the range to the size uh, of the clinical task, um, you're going to have a reduction that could go until the 50% of those reduction. So it's important to adequate the range size according to the clinical indication because we know that increasing the range size in one centimeter or uh, example 2.5 centimeters will going to correspond to uh, a higher exposure. And for example, you could see here that uh, it could correspond to our examinations that the patients could perform for, with clinical needs. So it's very important to adequate the range according to the clinical indication. Multiple phase protocols are also a problem. IAEA indicates also that multi-phase protocols must be avoided because they directly increase the patient dose. And it's important to, to understand that you should, should just use it when you need it. And the recent studies indicate that B-phase protocols could also be used, um, and especially for abdominal studies, and you could have Two, um, two moments of delay with a single acquisition and you also have a B-phase protocol study and you don't uh, have to expose the patient uh, twice. You could, you could also have more information about this topic about B-phase injection protocols on CT working group from Eurosafe campaign. 
Range in phases must be analyzed according to the clinical task because they are directly um, connected to the DLP value that the patient will be submitted. So you, you could find clinical, different clinical indications and dif different indications of the, the, the name size that you should use according to these tasks. And they should be both combined. Selecting the exposure perimeter is the most hard task uh, to have a correct uh, CT examination. We all know that all of them, uh, all of us want to have higher tube voltage, higher tube current, and higher grant imitation time because these perimeters will help us to have the best image quality. However, all of them are proportional to the increase of the dose. We also want to have the lowest pitches possible to have the, the, all the details of our body region in study. However, we also know that this, this decision has a relation to increase the dose. So it's important to adequate all the exposure perimeters to the examination that we are performing. To help us, some new tools are developed in our CT scanners. For example, you could have a tube voltage modulation. It could have different planes from different brands, but of course, at the end, they want to decrease the dose. And they are based on the patient size and also based on the clinical indication that you have to perform the exams. So you could have a lower examination dose values if you have this um, tool in your CT scanner. However, if you don't have it, you can reduce the tube voltage in some procedures that you normally perform with 120 kV. So, the most known optimization tool is the tube current modulation. It also depends on the type of CT scanner that you have. It could be based on the patient size, it could be based on the z-axis variation, could be based on angular variation or it could combine the z-axis and the angular variation together at the same time and it, uh, you will decrease the dose in your examination. If you have a CT scanner that could combine the modulation of the current and the modulation of the voltage at the same time, you're going to have a dose reduction that is higher than 50%. So it's important to be aware, if you have this technology in your scanner, you must try to understand how it works and take advantage of that. Recently, in some of the CT scanners, we already have interactive reconstruction. With this type of technology, we have already data in our sinogram of our original imaging. So with this, we just have image acquisition to obtain information uh, to correct our pre-information that is available on the sinogram. So it's possible to reduce the dose because you already have information when you start to perform your examination. If you want to have more information about interactive reconstruction, you also have a, a report written down by the CT Working Group available on Eurosafe website. So, interactive reconstruction will allow you to have artifact reduction and also to have better low contrast resolution. However, using uh, interactive reconstruction, um, it's sometimes hard at the beginning and you need to have specific training. For example, if you compare, if you have a photoback projection and then you pass to have the two current and the two voltage modulation, you could obtain a 30% of dose reduction. But if you have interactive reconstruction available, you could also reduce the dose value that you already had before. Using interactive reconstruction is like making a decision in all the exams because you need to select if you want to maintain your image quality and have a lower dose or if you want to have the best image quality with the same dose that you already used before. So this decision must be taken in team to analyze the 
the situation of the patient and to analyze if you, in this, in this specific case, you could have a dose reduction or if you need to have a high image quality. So the definition of protocol is a thing that you read and you know that there's a lot of uh, papers that talk about it, but you need to adequate this to your specific scanner. You need to know how your equipment works. And with this, we are prepared to adequate the protocol to the patient motion, to the small structures and to the low contrast structures. It's hard because we know that we need to manipulate the exposure parameters that directly going to increase the dose. And at the same time, we want to have high image quality and lower dose and non-artifacts included in our image. So you have to take a lot of decisions. And at the same time, you need to think and the clinical tasks that the patient has and the specific characteristics that the patients have when they come to your department. So for each examination, you have a lot of decisions to make. It's important to be aware of those optimization measures. However, it's also important to analyze what happens to the patient dose or and to your image quality. Looking for image quality is like going through a balance when you want to have lower dose or high dose. If you have high dose, of course you're going to have high image quality. However, it will be not good, uh, be good for your patient. And if you want to balance to have lower quality, you may miss a diagnostic. And of course, at this moment, uh, you need to think what is happening in your dose. So it's important to balance and you have to handle the with care and for each examination you have to think how to balance between dose and image quality because you are looking for the image that allows you to diagnostic. So image quality must be analyzed in two different modes but they should be together. It should be analyzed in objective mode and also in subjective mode. Objective mode normally is performed using image processing tools and subjective mode uh, normally is performing using the clinical and uh, professional's involvement. So before you start to analyze your image, it's very important to analyze the conditions that you have when you are performing the reporting. For example, you need to check your monitors and you also need to check the environment the, that you have when you are reporting. It's important to understand if the luminous ratios are according to the indications for a primary monitor. And it's also important to understand if the conditions for have a good report are maintained during all the analysis and if they are correct for each specific image modality. Our important thing is the observers that you're going to have. You need to select observers with similar experience. They should have more than five years of experience and they should be um, aware that they are looking for um, specific um, criteria. If you are performing objective image analysis, normally you could have eight points that are recommended on guidelines. You could perform your objective image analysis in different modes. You could perform it for quality control phantoms, with anthropomorphic phantoms, or in patient images. If you have the quality control phantoms, sometimes they have a software that allows you to have all this um, information, all these um, points that you could analyze in automatic mode. If you don't have it, you could use a uh, image processing tool and you could perform ROIs in homogeneous areas and analyze the noise and the signal and also the spatial resolution 
and obtain all the information uh, from your image. You could use this on anthropomorphic images or on page, patient images. Subjective image analysis, it's a little bit more hard to perform because it not just depends on image processing. So you have to have observers included, and as I said before, they should have similar experience. But if you have more than three, you could also have different types of observers. They could be from different professional groups. It could be also interesting. And it's important to use the correct imaging criteria. For example, on European guidelines, you have tables that indicate imaging criteria for each CT examination. For example, here you have the quality imaging criteria for head CT examination, these five points presented on the left, and then you have a scale that indicates if this criteria was fulfilled or not fulfilled. You, for, for collecting data of subjective image analysis, you can use software that helps you to calculate um, the, the imaging criteria score that uh, was performed by the observers, or if, if you could do it in a, without the software, you could do it with a, a handmade. After you have the data, you need to use specific uh, statistical examinations. It's important to, to understand that you need to compare the criteria that each observer used and if the imaging criteria are being fulfilled. The most uh, frequently used methods are VGC analysis using rock groups analysis to uh, compare if the optimized protocols are fulfilling the imaging criteria that you have on your guidelines. Of course, that if you compare your subjective image analysis and your objective image analysis together, you could have a comparison about what is happening in to your image in terms of quality, considering that you have changed the protocol. However, there are guidelines to change the protocols. You could look for example, on this, this scheme, and you will see that you need to be prepared to meet a lot of times. You need to have discussions with different professionals that are involved on the CT examination performed and reported, and also try to change just one point at a time, and then analyze the image, and then discuss again what is happening to your image quality. With all this data of image quality analysis, you will be able to change your protocol. So, you are trying to change your DRL. You have obtained your DRL um, your, for a specific CT examination and you want to optimize the DRL. You are trying to balance this radiation dose and image quality. It, it, however, you need to do it in the teamwork and the clinical task and the specific patient characteristic must be analyzed in order to define the correct way to optimize the procedures. So, in conclusion, knowledge and training in CT promotes good practice. Analysis of the dose values and image quality is mandatory during the optimization of our procedures and CT optimization measure must be effectively used in our daily practice in order to promote the patient's safety. We all know that medical imaging saves life, however, they should be optimized. So, thank you for your attention during the session. Thank you, Dr. Santos, for this uh, very uh, comprehensive presentation covering different aspects of uh, optimization of uh, CT procedures. Uh, for me, one of the main messages, uh, in addition to the technical aspects, is the importance of the team approach that you highlighted several times. So we need, uh, of course, radiologists, we need radiographers, we need medical physicists, 
in this process. Uh, we have already uh, questions, uh, so we can start reading and answering them. And I invite the participants to ask questions or submit comments. Uh, can you see the first uh, comment? We have in the chat box a comment that I want to start with from Dr. Vesna Gershon. Um, focusing on the need of standardization of the uh, names of the city protocols. Uh, she says, we face problem with non-standardized city protocol names among hospitals. This complicates things towards setting of URLs. So city prot protocol names should be unified and some international effort is very welcome. Uh, I think uh, this is a problem uh, that everybody uh, who starts with uh, not only establishing DRL but also in those monitoring problem faced first. So uh, I have, would like to ask both speakers to provide comments on this. Could I uh, could I intervene, uh, Diana? Yes, please, Professor Freire. Okay. So I think this is a, a very important question. And uh, the recent trend in the European Commission and also in two European meeting was to say that instead of having DRS, which currently are based on the anatomical location, uh, to speak uh, instead of uh, clinical based DRL. For example, if you take uh, a chest city and if you are performing a chest city for pulmonary embolism, or for uh, coronary calcification scoring, or for uh, low nodule detection, you know that the protocols are completely different. And uh, therefore, we, we think, and it was our, uh, I would say, what we asked the European Commission, and we have been uh, followed in that, to, to limit the concept of uh, TRA to some frequent uh, uh, clinical indications. And uh, the uh, European Commission has launched recently a tender, the name is Tenders Euclid, uh, with a purpose to establish uh, the first uh, clinical DRL in city. And I can tell you that we have decided to limit the scope to 10 to, to 12 clinical indications. And uh, therefore, the problem of uh, uh, of standardization of the name of protocols is probably uh, completely overcome because if you are speaking about pulmonary embolism, I think that uh, everyone knows what is the pulmonary embolism. There is no problem of translation between the French, German, Italian, and other languages. So uh, I think that we are today in an uh, uh, era where uh, uh, institutions are understanding that uh, the classical DRS are very difficult to manage and they uh, are starting to focus the uh, attention on the most uh, frequent clinical indication and therefore to limit the problem of uh, name personalization. Name. Thank you. Joanna, would you like to... Okay, can I comment on Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah, and I, I think that it's hard to be, because we have even in for each specific country, different codes that we use for CT scanners, uh, for CT examinations, sorry. If you go trying to collect data and the different systems that we have, um, you could find that uh, the professionals don't use the same code even in the same institution. So when you are trying to get a specific um, study, you don't find the correct data that you are expecting. Of, of course, that the point that Professor Frigia focused is very important. We need to think in DRLs in a different approach. We need to think on all the clinical tasks, starting by this sixth approach that Eurosafe presents on the website could be a good start, starting point. Thank you. I think this is uh, really an important question that uh, we in the IA, in collaboration with the societies, we can work further on. Uh, there are 
few more questions uh, tomorrow are coming so can we continue uh, can you see the questions in your uh, Q&A box yes uh, yeah you can read and answer okay. if you prefer yeah. or yeah uh, I have a here a question that said if we think that the CTDI files and DLP must be incorporated in routine CT project report. In some countries, it will be already mandatory um, in a few months. In the Europe, um, it's mandatory to have this information uh, in the reports. But it's very important to to know the. The URLs that we use in our department. I think that is more important to have it in, on the report. It's to compare the, the examination that I have performed with the, uh, the URL that is established in my department. Okay. Dr. Fringer, do you want to comment or can I? I don't have, have any comment on that. Okay. So I, can, I can see your question on my screen. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, there, are, there are another question about the, the CT scan, uh, those differences between the fan beam geometry and the cone beam geometry. And, um, uh, if you are talking about the CBCT images, for example, you don't have the same dose scripture in some of the scanners, so you cannot compare uh, the dose that you are using. Um, for, for the same procedures. Uh, normally you are using uh, CBCT images for radiotherapy priming or for oral imaging and this type of um, acquisition uh, should have lower dose values. However, I think that this uh, sometimes it, it, it don't happen and you have uh, higher dose values than, than you expected for Yeah, just uh, a comment. We are planning uh, in future a webinar dedicated to the dental community, so this may be of interest for the participants when we we'll focus on on this new, relatively new technology. Yeah. Um, another question that is presented here: it's about the subjective image quality analysis. Um, I have some experience to perform this in my studies. Uh, a tool that I indicated uh, was the, the European guidelines that have tables for the specific body regions that we are studying. But I think that we have a lack of imaging criteria, especially if we going through the, this clinical indication approach. Maybe we should also have in the future clinical imaging criteria based uh, on the clinical task, okay? But to start at the moment, for example, if you want to start uh, now, you could go through the guidelines. Uh, the European ones have at the end the tables for each specific body region, and you could uh, analyze if the criteria is fulfilled or not fulfilled. And you have scores there, you could analyze how to do it. Professor Frisia, uh, can you see the question about the Eurosafe imaging? Yes, we have a question, but whether Eurosafe is a branch of the image sensing, is right? Just to clarify the difference, yeah. Uh, no, Eurosafe is completely dependent on image. Image sensing has been established in America, and uh, Eurosafe is established in Europe, and the goal of uh, image sensing is uh, mostly focused on PDF imaging, why the goal of Eurosafe imaging is much more holistic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there are more questions on the technical part. You are yeah. in the can, I, can I send a link of a free way to calculate? Is it possible to do it? Can I write it down on the chat? Or it's yeah, you can, uh, and you can in, uh, address all participants. Okay. Just uh, select send to all participants, and everybody can see the link. I'm not sure if everybody is seeing. Or you can I'm send to us, and we'll share with okay. the participants. Oh, it's in the other shop. Okay, I already see it. 
I'm sending. This link that I sent here, it's uh, a way to perform um, hematology analysis, uh, the VGC analysis in the free way on the internet. There was a question about it. Just looking for us. Yeah. There is question on um, what would you prefer a DRL with the iterative reconstruction or without? <laughs> <laughs> I think it, if you have interactive reconstruction, of course, it's good to use it and you should compare. But at the moment, worldwide, you don't have. Uh, interactive reconstruction available in all scanners. So uh, maybe you will compare with a small amount of data, uh, but of course, uh, if you have interactive reconstruction in your CT scanner, you should use it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, to my knowledge, there is no DRL that yeah. is uh, speci specific for, uh, uh, for type reconstruction. Yeah. But just, probably in future we can do this. Yeah, just local studies that have used interactive reconstruction to calculate not a, a, a recommended DRL, as you said, Jenny. Mm -hmm. um, there was, is one uh, question about pediatric procedures. Yeah, um, I mentioned a factor of 2.5 for pediatric patients because the recommendations of CTDI vol calculation must be. Um, for pediatrics, must be the phantom size of 10 centimeters and 16 centimeters. However, majority of our scanners have the CTI ball calculated for adults. That's why when you analyze the CTI balls for pediatric, you should use the factor of 2.5. Uh, there is one related question uh, about the size of the phantoms for measuring DRL in pediatric CT. In fact, we are not measuring DRL, we are measuring CTDI, but you can answer yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, you should use the, the 10 centimeter CTDI phantom for head CT examinations and the 16 centimeter phantom for body examinations. That's our recommendation. However, if you you use the the if you have available in your scanner the values uh, that are recommended for adults, you could use it and then use the factor to perform the calculation. A question to both of you. Uh, the question comes comes from Brasilia. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the minimum team to compose? The optimization program. Dr. Frisia, do you want to start? Or can I, I don't understand the question. Uh, the team, what team we need to have uh, in order to perform optimization of yeah. CT? We, if you want, I can start. Okay. Can I? Yes. Go, go okay. ahead. So you, I think that we must have an integrated team. It's important to, of course, know that we are performing a CT examination to have a report. Right? So, of course, radiologists must be included in this team approach. The radiographers that perform the examination must be also included in this team approach. And the physicists should be also included because it helps us to perform the, the quality and, and, and the, the image quality and also some quality control. So I think it's a team approach. You, you need to have at least three different types of professional. However, it's better if you could include more than one uh, per, person for each professional group. Uh, not include one of these professionals that should be involved in optimization Normally, uh, don't take you to the optimization process. All of them are important to different tasks. Thank you. May uh, I say that I, I completely support that. For example, in Eurosafe Imaging, you know, we have uh, medical physicists and radiographers which are working in the same, uh, in the same uh, 
the same organization. And I, I think that uh, the access or even uh, uh, availability of a medical physicist is, for me, of the most importance because things are going to be much more complex. And uh, also the role of radio is fundamental because the radio is really in contact with the equipment of the patient. And I think what it is important is not only to have a team, but to have uh, a common global project. For example, uh, if you are working on optimization, I think that uh, the goal to establish local DRL are extremely important. And uh, what we we are considering today, uh, if you are working at uh, clinical DRL, is uh, to take the most frequent clinical indication in your institution and to have a repository, a local repository, on which you could establish your local DRL. And then you could compare with other uh, institutions, or even you could contribute with your data to the establishment of national DRL. Yeah, I can only support this uh, because uh, this is what we here at DIA also believe that it's extremely important to promote the work of the team and the optimization and the team, every team member has the role and uh, they only add value in the final goal. Um, there is one Technical question, let's say, well, uh, when will the IDRL report be available in the final version? <laughs> Can you, do you know this? <laughs> Can you inform the participants? I, I don't have the information. Okay. Yeah, we only know that the report is submitted, has been submitted a time ago, approved. But uh, I also don't have information when it will, it will be published. Professor Fuja, if you no, I, I, I don't know. We are waiting to find a draft of PIDRA. But uh, I, I think the most important conclusion is now we well know that we need to establish PIDRA. Uh, this is maybe the most important conclusion. And I can tell you that on the Eurosex side, uh, we are starting, uh, we have started a working group on that. And uh, we would uh, try to convince the European Commission to, uh, uh, to, to, to provide some funding for the establishment of PIDRM because if you want to collect data and so on, uh, this needs uh, organization manpower and of course money. Okay, thank you. We have uh, quite many questions and only a few minutes left, but uh, we can still address some of them. Um, there is a question about the use of effective dose calculated from DLP, how it should be interpreted in the optimization efforts uh, as opposed to CTDI volume. Uh, Rana, maybe you can answer this. You should uh, analyze the, the DLP value, and for pediatric patients, it, it, there is a different key factors than for adults. They are the key factors are characterized uh, uh, according to the patient age. They are available on the last ANSCI report, and, and but however they are just presented for the most frequent CT examinations. Uh, however, it could be a useful tool if you have a patient that uh, had been submitted to different hematch modality exposures because effective dose allows you to calculate, uh, to, another, to compare different hematch modality approaches. There was uh, a question here about, so, sorry Jenny. If I can just add here that uh, according uh, also to the recommendations uh, of the IA uh, and ICRP, uh, effective dose uh, should never be used for individual patients or it, uh, it is uh, just additional uh, quantity for risk estimate. For, uh, and for optimization, we need to use uh, the, the quantities provided by the equipment or measurable quantities like CTDI and the DLP. 
any active guests. Uh, it's just additional, at least at the level of knowledge we have at the moment. So effective dose uh, is not the primary, the primary quantity in the optimization. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, what time frame would you estimate for implementation of local DRL from beginning to end with sufficient data? Three months, six months, one year? And it, it depends on the body region that you are studying. For adults, it, will, it depends, of, of course, of the frequency of the examinations of your department. But for adults, it would be more easy to, to, to calculate the RLs because you could include all the patient ages. For pediatrics, you should have data for one year at least because um, you have to have patients for the different age or age categorizations. So it's more hard to have enough data. Okay. Yeah, the sample should be big enough at least. Yeah. At least. 50, let's say, patients, but it depends but on if, the... If I may, uh, you know, I think yeah. whatever you want to do, uh, I think that it is absolutely important to, to have uh, at your disposal a, a, a dose management system with an automated dose recording. And, and I think that uh, people which very, very much be uh, sensitive to that, if you want to make progresses in optimization, you have to buy uh, a dose management system. Yeah, well, whatever, well, whatever the system. Yeah, I agree that those management system uh, help a lot in all management of data, not only optimization. It could be the data can be used in different purposes. I just want to inform the participants that here at the IA, we work on a safety report on guidance uh, on those reporting. Uh, we hope that it will be finalized uh, within this year and published uh, later next year. And of course, we cooperate with several international organizations and international experts in that efforts because we know how important it is for the member states to have more guidance on this relatively new aspect. Uh, yeah, I know we have more questions. If you see in your uh, boxes something that we w would like to address, otherwise we can ask the participants to send their questions to the emails, uh, to your your email. Ivana's email is displayed on the screen now. Yeah. And also in a few minutes, you'll have the patient protection ad uh, email address. Would you like to see some, some conclu concluding words at the end? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, w I would like to, just my point of view, of uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Frigia in the part of having an informatic system that helps you. However, um, considering that I have uh, looked for the, the different countries that uh, the attendees of the session uh, are, uh, I think that it's also important to, uh, to remember that if you don't have uh, the, the all the technology available to you, you could also optimize your procedure doing in a hard way <laughs> um, format. Okay, uh, the team approach it's very important uh, in to to obtain uh, the complete optimization of the, the process. And if you can do it by yourself, uh, if you imagine that is possible, you should involve all the different professionals that are involved on CT examinations. I completely support that. Completely. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, at the end I would like to thank uh, for the speakers. Uh, and also the European Society of Radiology for partnering in this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, our next webinar will be announced soon. Uh, and uh, 
the broadcast has been recorded and in few days during the, the probably in the end of uh, in the beginning of next week it will be available for late, for viewing from the webinar page you can uh, see uh, you can approach this page from the uh, main page of the ARPO website going down to the webinars and uh, you can see the whole list including the, today's webinar uh, I want to encourage you to learn more of, on this topic uh, by using the e-learning uh, that the IA launched in November last year and since then we have more than 1200 registered users and almost 500 certificates of completion uh, have been issued you can approach, you can find this e-learning on CT irrigation dust management in CT from the training page of the ARPOP website. Uh, I want to encourage uh, also to uh, apply and to register for the International Conference on Radiation Protection in Medicine five years after BOM with the motto Achieving Change in Practice that will help 11 to 15th of December this year here in Vienna in the headquarters of the IEA. The conference is co-organized with the World Health Organization and Pan American Health Organization and with cooperation of a number of international and professional societies including the European Society of Radiology and USA will be also involved. Uh, the conference is free of registration uh, fee, so you can uh, submit, uh, you can learn more uh, how to register from the website. You can see the web page of the conference or uh, approaching uh, the uh, conference team uh, using the email address. Um, so I think with this we can conclude. Uh, thank you for your participation and have a wonderful day or night. You may now disconnect. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.